eBay sellers, you have landed on episode number 167 of eBay the right way. Today's date is May 29th, 2024. And my guest today is Stephanie from The Organized Flamingo. No announcements this week, so let's jump right in. Welcome back, eBayers and online sellers. I have a fun guest today, and um, she's going to give us some tips and information about staying organized because she is a professional organizer. So how are you doing today, Stephanie? Hi, Suzanne. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good. And uh, you reached out to me to come on the podcast and talk a little bit about what you do and maybe give some tips to eBay sellers um, for staying more organized, because that is definitely a challenge with uh, listed inventory, unlisted inventory, and just running a business in general. So I think this will be very helpful. Yeah. Um, so let's start off with how you got into the business of organizing. Yeah. So, well, I've been doing this for over 20 years and the profession itself was fairly newer at the time, um, meaning being called a professional organizer. So when I first started, I am originally from California and I was in Southern California at around college. I started a production and event planning business. And I did really well. I started it in college and I knew that's what I wanted to do. Like that, this is my, my thing. Right. Um, so I started doing weddings and events and trade shows when I was doing that business, there was a catering company that I worked with within the events industry that would often have all of their props and all the stuff that they would, you know, have to decorate the events. And one day they said, oh, yeah, can you go get what I need, you know, in the in their warehouse? And I went in and it was it was something it was a site. It was a site. It was really hard to find anything. They knew kind of where things were. But as far as somebody knew, like me going in to find something new, um, there was no way I was going to be able to find it. And I remember saying, hey, do you think would you be OK if I organized this? This was just really more because that was my strength. Um, finding and sorting things is just kind of what comes very natural. Uh, and they were always so kind to me, always giving me business and the repeated business. And the owner really wanted to grow. Um, but when I went into that warehouse and I couldn't find anything, I, I just imagined there is I can see why you're so overwhelmed and I can see why you can't find someone to help you because it's kind of a vicious circle. So I said, do you mind if I do this? And she said, oh my gosh, I that would love it. So I did. And the love, the bug just hit from there. And it just like, this was, um, I went online to look at associations and this being part of an industry. And then I found people like me that did organ the other side of organizing, not the planning side of events, uh, and then from there on, I, um, long story short, there's a lot of stuff in between, but that's how I got into it. Great. Okay. So um, how do clients find you? Yeah. Okay. So then going back to that history of it, the, I, I worked on my own. I sold that company. Then I moved to Colorado. Um, I worked for um businesses and corporate, you know, corporate America, if you will, doing organizing um, archives and libraries and digitizing um, and everything in between doing really big moves of big buildings to other buildings. So I've been involved in the different aspects of organizing. When I left that world, and so I did independent contracting, also worked for corporate America, if you will, for other people, assisting other people. When I left, people knew that that's what I did. And when I started the Organized Flamingo uh, in 2019, they knew that this is what I had been doing for a really long time. So first it was referrals. And then, you know, from there, your your business just kind of um goes from there, whether it's ads and whatnot. But I mean, I'm available online and then people do a search on decluttering or estate clear out. And if they're local to Colorado, they'll find me or I'll be available for referrals. Okay. So um, 
what is your connection with eBay sellers? What are some situations where you have helped them? Yeah, well, first, I'm a huge fan. This is why I reached out to Suzanne. I've been a huge, huge fan of the podcast uh, way before I even thought about reaching out and being a guest. So I've been doing my podcast for a little while, um, but that was unrelated. You know, those were two very separate things. I just loved the stories behind the people that you interviewed. I um, joined your group really more as as a consumer versus because I do this for a living. And then once I was in your group, um, I started seeing these patterns, of course, of, oh my gosh, you know, you, you, you do this as a bit, a lot of people do this as a business. I could definitely help or, oh, wow, I didn't know that you've taught me something that I can look more into. So that's how I got into, uh, you know, approaching you and doing this. And then, um, in the in the middle of all this is happening parallel to each other the sandwich generation is really growing and that is a big part of uh, a big part of my audience that I've been helping for a very long time. So people will reach out when their loved ones have passed away. Um, maybe they need to downsize or maybe they're helping a loved one downsize. It's not always somebody has gone, you know, sometimes it's just they're ready. They're ready to depart and, and let go of stuff. So, um, and then I have a lot of families who maybe their sibling was an only, you know, they they didn't really have an extended family or close family. So they're responsible for it and they need help. So I have quite a bit of those types of clients. And so when I joined your group and then started to talk to more people about eBay and uh, and whatnot, I realized that they were like very similar, you know, very similar things. And within what I do, a lot of the clients are looking to make money or they're looking to find out if their stuff is worth anything. And that is where I will, you know, call an eBay reseller or I'll go to your group and see if anybody does or sells that specific type of thing. And if they're local to Colorado, if they're willing or able to come pick it up or look at it or whatever it may be. Um, so that's how that introduction to eBay, eBay selling comes in. Um, and then, of course, I've had my own personal experiences here and there. But then from there, I've been able to help eBay sellers. Like, they'll reach out. They, they've realized, oh, this is what you do for them. Can you just come and help me organize my stuff? And just so that I can find it easier when I need it to sell right. or you know, whatever, maybe. Okay. Well, I remember about 10 years ago, I reached out to a professional organizer. And my angle was, what do you do with all the stuff that you're getting rid of? And I know my listeners are going to be thinking along those lines. Hmm, maybe I should partner with that type of uh, person. You know, real estate agents are another good one because they're helping people clean out their houses to get them on the market. And it's making those connections and those relationships with uh, people in your industry as a way to get things to sell. Because I personally have helped quite a few people either. Uh, downsize an estate or help when a parent passed or, uh, you know, those types of situations where, you know, I had my hands on the stuff and um, it's, it is, it's overwhelming for the homeowner, whatever you want to call them, um, especially if there's a death, because um, you, you just can't think, you can't process it. You're processing so much at that time. And it's so emotional and you'll be working through the boxes or whatever, and you'll come across something and they just, they need a few minutes to have a meltdown because, Oh, I haven't seen that in 20 years. And it's, it's very emotional. So I guess the, the big question is what do you do with the leftovers or things that are going to be discarded or, you know, not, not everybody wants to sell the stuff. They just need to get that area that home cleaned out so they can move on. Yeah. And that is where professional organizers differ and we, we can all, you know, all work together. And I think something for the listeners too, is sometimes what I'll get is like, it's this competition and, and it doesn't have to be that way um, because professional organizers are really there for more of the lifestyle piece of the client. So what we do is, well, we just try to make the best out of the situation and hoping to whatever that may be. So our, our, 
what we do is we'll ask the client, like, what is ultimately, what would you, what feeling would you like to have at the end? So that we can, we can see if donating is the best way or selling it is the best way or high or giving it or having an eBay, eBay reseller come in and, and see if there's something that they can do with their stuff uh, or auction houses and whatever it may be, because there's so many avenues. And I think at the end of the day, the homeowner or the person, uh, the, the owner of this stuff has to feel good about releasing whatever method it was. Um, and that is where we kind of try to figure that out more, get to know them a little bit more, knowing that we have no um, incentive necessarily, mostly, not all, you know, a lot of organizers do do a little bit of both, but for the most part, organizers just have this very middle ground. Like we, it, it makes no difference to us at the end of the day, as long as your life is easier and simpler, whatever that may be. Uh, so what we do is, yeah, we'll just we're very resourceful. That's for sure. <laughs> and so for me specifically, um, I'll talk about me specifically, but like as a company, like that is my mission to find resources for people so that they don't end up in the stuff doesn't end up in the landfill. So there's a as much of a win-win as possible um, for all parties involved. And especially knowing that there's just so much stuff out there, so much stuff that there is no possible way that just one person can hold on to it or sell it all. So my hope is just, you know, to find and be resourceful, the resourceful person for that person that needs to downsize um, and maybe so overwhelmed that they can't really do it themselves. We'll be back after a quick break. Money is all around us and we think about it more than almost every other aspect of our lives. But how can we make more of it and what's our drive for building wealth beyond just the numbers in our bank account? Join us on the Make More podcast as our host, Matt Heslin, brings to you a dynamic lineup of experts in the world of investing, business, health, and beyond. Together, they unpack the secrets to not just surviving, but thriving in today's economy. It's about more than just wealth. It's about crafting life experiences, seizing opportunities, and building a legacy. Subscribe now to the Make More with Matt Heslin podcast and join us every week for new expert insights and inspiration. Well, and you mentioned the sandwich generation and um, is that Gen Xers? So it's not really defined by a generation like that. It's a generation of a, um, it's when you are sandwiched in between taking care of a loved one, an elder loved one, and also a younger loved one. Most, of course, notably, it's a parent and a child uh, and you are stuck in the middle. And maybe not stuck as the middle, but that is, right. you know, you're in, yeah. you're sandwiched in the middle between caring for both. Then within the sandwich generation, there's a couple different types of types of sandwiches. <laughs> so that is if you are more in the 50s, 60s, maybe a grandparent, and you're also now um, taking care of the grandchildren in an emotional or financial support. So it could be both or either. It doesn't have to be all um and so the, that you're just sandwiched in between taking care of other others right. and others' needs. Yeah. And that sandwich generation often does not want the belongings, possessions of the parents. Mm -hmm. They just don't want it. Do you come across that? I do. So that's a big topic. It's not that they don't want it. It's that they don't need it. In, in, and that is very different than before. So before the generation, well, first there was less choices. They, it was things to buy were not readily available through an online shopping situation, one click, and then they would get it. Um, they would have to order it and have someone make it and go to the store. And it was an event and it was just stuff was not readily available. So when they finally ordered it, it was their hard earned money and they kept it and they kept it for a long time because they knew that getting a new one was not going to be as easy. I'm sure a lot of listeners can relate where your parent would say like, you know, take care of your stuff, you know, take care of it. Um, and it was almost like if you broke it or scratched it, or you got a, uh, something on your shirt, it was like this big deal. And you, because, because your mom, your parents knew that, Getting a new one was not going to be as easy or cheap as it, it is now. And so in today's age, it's, well, oh, you got a rip. Well, we'll just get you a new one because it's just so much easier. So that right there, the burden and the feeling of I need to keep my stuff long term is different. That in itself is just going to be different. 
So that stuff that was carried on like that before for older generations, it's, well, why, why would you not want to take care of your stuff? And why wouldn't you want that? I took care of this for years, for decades. And your grandma took care of this for you so that you had this and you didn't have to rebuy it. But now this new generation is just more like, well, but I can go get it. I can go get a new one. So that, that, that feeling is just different on its own. And um, so it's not that they don't want it. It's that they don't need it. Now there is the component also, that's just a different style, right? Like sometimes you just don't want to follow what your, your parents did, or um, that's just an older style or you just don't like it. So our, our, that changes like our, our, our feelings on that change. Um, but it's just more, well, I don't need to go pick it up, go hire a mover, go haul it all, you know, back to the five different locations I'm going to be moving to. Um, That just seems like a lot of work. So they just don't need to. They don't need it. Right. And that changes the dynamic. I came across a situation over the past few years um, with someone I was trying to help downsize. And it was an older lady. And um, she was just horrified that... Her kids did not want all the, you know, table linens and all the beautiful things that were beautiful to her. You know, it's, they did not have the same emotional attachment to things and she couldn't get her grown adult children to understand, um, you know, this is an important family heirloom and you need to be responsible for it and you need to carry it forward and give it to future generations. And the The grown children were like, I don't have time for that. It doesn't mean anything to me. Sell it to somebody who will treasure it. And she just absolutely did not like that idea. She wanted it in the family. So um, do you come across that kind of thing where it's just, oh yeah. what, what is the solution when the adult children, they don't want to, they got enough of their own crap. They don't need more stuff. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're busy, sometimes have careers and, you know, they don't have time to deal with all of their parents' things. Um, and it, it became a real um, pain point between the children and the, you know, grandma. Um, so how do you resolve that? Yeah, we come across that all the time. Um, so the, the, the new, if the new owners of this stuff, they need to need it. So, if you if the if you are in the position where you're trying to give it away, people need to need the things like I mentioned before. So if your son, daughter, grandchild doesn't need it, well, that's that. You are, so that's that. You know there there is no continuation to that. If you're trying to find and you need to find a need, so if somebody needs to sell it, can you find that solution? Like who needs it? whether it's for the financial or for the resources. So if you have a lot of wood, very antique wood, if it's a very expensive wood, find someone who needs the wood, who needs the item. So that's the one thing that I really focus with clients as far as decluttering or letting go or managing of of the downsizing piece. Um, It's finding the people who need it so that you can continue it on after that with that being said if family is trying to you know continue the tradition I hope that listeners can understand that um, the new the new generation a new person is its own self they're learning their own lifestyle they're learning their own wants and they're learning they're going around the world and figuring themselves out so what you are passing on may not fit into what they're learning and what they want their style to be and so accepting that is hard it's really really hard we do work with a lot of clients where we talk them through that motion of I know this is the first time that you are releasing this and that all your hard-earned work and the resources that it took for you to get this are feels like they're just being squashed you know their feet it feels like they're just being thrown in the garbage literally um but it's not that you took you appreciated for what it was it served its purpose for you and that's where that ends and hopefully it will serve the purpose of someone close to you like a family and you can inherit it but if you if it doesn't 
then that's kind of where we we just the acceptance we just have to continue to continue on um because if not then it'll just be this vicious circle it'll be resentment it'll just continue and that's not fair for anybody now we do have quite a bit of a, a new thing that's popping up is a, we have quite a bit of clients who will put money aside um, for whenever, you know, it's it's their time to go or just really to downsides, just to put into savings so that that new family member can then um, use that money to dispose of it or hire one of us or somebody, uh, you know, an estate seller or someone. So basically they're saying, look, I know I have a lot of stuff. I love my stuff. I don't want anyone to tell me otherwise, and I'm not ready to let go, but I understand that it's my stuff and it's not yours. So here's a little bit of money so that when I do go or when I, whatever it happens, um, then you don't feel the burden of, of having to, you know, to pay for somebody to remove all these items. So we are seeing quite a bit of people do that, which is a big, um, a big advancement or like a big step forward for people because before it was just this resentment. Um, so that's been really nice to see just them appreciating, appreciating that. Have you ever come across a hoarder situation or do you just not take on those types of clients? I used to, but I don't anymore. Um, we had someone on our team who was a hoarding specialist and an OC special OCD specialist. So we did, but we don't anymore. So, um, that is a very specific type um, more on the personality trait. And so, because it is a mental health disorder, we don't work with that unless we know that they're working with someone else and then we'll help with it. But if we can't do it on our own and unless there's somebody there with them. Yeah. That's a very complicated illness. Really. It's, it's not just about removing the stuff. It's about why they keep bringing it in and why they feel like they need it around them. And it can be overwhelming. Like they don't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it falls under the compulsion. So it's actually very similar to OCD, which I know it's it feels like why well, how could that be? But it, it is. Uh, it's on the same um, chart. So that's something that a licensed um, psychotherapist or licensed medical profession can definitely help people with. But it does fall under the same. It's just the inability to. Uh, it's just, it's a compulsion, an inability to let go, literally, uh, also mentally. And so because of that, it there's just a little bit more work to be done. You don't want to traumatize somebody um, into just releasing it. That's not the goal of, of it at all. Um, so you don't want to traumatize. You don't want to give the, a negative connotation to the to the stuff because then you you can just come right back to it. So they obviously try to treat more of the originating compulsion so that it doesn't happen again. So then we will go in and help with the decluttering or downsizing if they're working with someone. So I have done those. Um, and then with those, we sort and then we resource, we call people who are willing to um, come in and want to sell it, donate, you know, we donate it. And then we just, depending on the goal too, I think we, um, for anybody listening, I think if you know what the person who's trying to give away this stuff, if you know what their goal is, so if their goal is, I need this done by in a week, your, your whole method is going to look very different than if the people have all the time in the world, right? I mean, if they only have a week to get rid of it, then our, our resources or our, options are limited. Um, but if they have a little more time, then we can help them in different ways. Uh, also, if their goal is more legacy, like I just want to make sure we have, we had actually just had a client who um, her parents were um, costume designers for different plays and stuff like that. So they had very specific type of like costume and uh, regalia and, you know, the hats and the things like that, that are more like props and, and, and stage type of stuff. Um, so what we did with them is they did have the ability to wait. So we stored it in, um, in a climate controlled storage for them so that they could get it out of the space. And then, you know, we went through that process of, okay, let's see if we can donate this stuff under their name, uh, because what was really important for them is for their parents' legacy and name to continue on and seeing if they could maybe get like their plaque or name on a, on like some theater, you know, like a chair or something like that. So we did more of that bartering. Um, hey, you know, if we get, if we can donate this, can you get their name under like their legacy? So, you know, it depends on what the person's overall goal is. And it, and and we kind of go from there. Okay. 
Um, do you have any specific tips for eBay sellers as far as organizing inventory or office? Yes. Or let's let's delve into that realm. A yes, bit. yes, let's get more specific to that. So um, we, I actually have worked quite a bit with people who um, like thrift stores and and warehouses and stuff. And I think the difference here between a person who does eBay or sells it as like either a hobby business or their full time business is that they need to treat that area as that. And it's it's all so it's more about how can I find the things that I need when I need them as efficiently as possible so that I can sell them, so I can find them, so I can ship them. So that's kind of the like the the main tip. Um, so what we've done is before is having more the shelving type of area of course you know everybody has different um, size rooms if you have a smaller closet or whatever maybe but basically any any space where you can get things in and out easily without feeling like you have to move 20 things to get to the thing behind it um we call that you know we typically you don't want to go like three to five levels. So think of it like if you were thinking of a digital organizing folders, you know, subfolders, or maybe even your folders on your fi- on your file cabinet. Um, you don't want to go too subfoldery. You don't want to get too so if you're in your physical space, if you are going, if the stuff that you're selling, let's say you're a clothing reseller and you and that's your that's what you do. Uh and you have to go really deep to get that one shirt like super super deep. It's going to be overwhelming at some, you know, unless you, for the pros out there, you all have your system. Okay. You, you know what you like. Um, but we're trying to avoid the overwhelm of trying to get the thing so that you're not procrastinating on selling it, uh, procrastinating on delivering it or shipping it, you know, ha- having those problems of, well, where's my order? It's like, oh, well, I, I still have to go to the storage room. Then I have to move 10 boxes. Then after the 10th box, it's like at the very bottom. And the thought of that is so overwhelming. So we're trying to avoid as many steps as possible. Um, if you, and, and even if it means leaving like some aisles um, in between so that you can get to that one box in the back. So you don't have to root. So it's just as many steps as possible. Leaving as much what we call it is uh, white space in kind of the styling and um, organizing space. We call it white space. And that just means that it's okay to have nothing there so that you can easily grab things and go and move your hand. I mean, let's, you know, I'm not sure you know, people can't see, but like if I can demonstrate this bin, I mean, you have to put your hand in the bin and get it out and over and pull it. So that white space of that area needs to be free. So stacking stuff on top of each other with no white space will just suffocate the stuff, will suffocate you, will suffocate the space, and then domino effect from there. So if you have inventory that you keep and it's... um you know, starting to pile up, just make some, make some room so that you can wiggle, you can move your shoulders, you can grab it, uh, and then kind of go from there. And of course, if it means some, some, for some people, it just means downsizing, um, you know, or, or kind of, uh, cleaning that out, getting the stuff that you don't sell, doing a lot of that, like having a consistent, maybe quarterly, whatever your schedule allows, even if it's like 15 minute, decluttering sprints. That's what we call them. We're just called an actual 15 minute timer. What can I get rid of? Or what can I give to somebody else or donate that's not selling in my shop? Um, and doing those types of sprints or maybe a big project, whatever works best for your personality. But that that's an, a, another big one. So, you know, white space, declutter. Don't suffocate and yourself. I think <laughs> the method depends on how your brain works because- um, for me personally, I like to be able to see everything. Um, it might be in a closet that I have to open, but I keep things in uh, the clear tubs. I only stack them three high, but the heaviest things on the bottom. And so I sell clothing and like stuffed animals. So um, I can see what's in that tub before I even open it. You know, if I'm if I sold a dress and it's you know a blue and green print, I can look in that tub and see where it is before I even put my hand in there. That's how my brain works. Or if it's on shelving, I like 
to be able to see, you know, okay, if I have a whole bunch like bras, if I have a whole bunch of those, they'll be in a uh, one of those cloth uh, fabric bins. I use those a lot, but you know, you can grab that. It's lightweight. Look in there. These are the black ones. These are the patterned ones, whatever. Um, that's how my brain works. I got to be able to see it. And my goal is to put my hands on it in 30 seconds or less when it sells. Uh, but some people like the numbering system where as they're listing things, they are assigning an inventory number like A is for the bin and 12 is the number of item, you know, that's the 12th item that's going in there. Um, and then they put that number on their listing so they can, or on their inventory spreadsheet so they can immediately find it. But I can't do that. I can't mix all these different things together. <laughs> it's like, it's, it has to be sorted by type of thing. Yes. And the some category. people use the banker, the banker boxes for their inventory storage and it's just as they're listing things they're putting it in box number a b c whatever and um so i don't i personally don't think there's a right or wrong it's how your brain works you may have worked at a store and this is how they did their inventory so you just do it that way or if you were in the military you have ways that you do things that uh so that everybody was consistent. Um, so do you want to speak to that part of it? Yeah. Yeah. So we, so I actually have a whole um, workshop on categorizing because, oh my goodness, that can just go on forever. <laughs> I'm sure, list, you know, for me, like I've been stuck in that where I have a polka dot pink dress. I mean, I can technically organize it under pink. It's also under a pattern. It could, it's also clothing. It's also a skirt. It's also an A-line. Like the, So items have a, quite a bit of categories or tags to them. And it is, it's really defining, especially when you're doing it as a business, it's defining how am I going to be able to get the things that I need when I need them as efficiently as possible and defining efficiency for you. Because so for some people, efficiency, it's I need this in 30 seconds or less because I'm the type of person that responds within an hour. Like that is your claim to fame. For other sellers, it's it you know more antique. Like I have what they need, so I need to be as specific as possible with my categorizing. I need to have it on a spreadsheet. So if someone messages me because I'm such a particular finder, you know, of eBay of, of stuff, like they know I, I they come for the very specific treasures. So. If I have a garment that is all these things, I need to categorize it by all of those things. It's pink, it's suede, it's long, it's, you know, uh, for women, boys, size. I mean, you name it, you tag everything in that spreadsheet. So therefore you are a spreadsheet person. It That can, if you have a spreadsheet, that way you can search the key term that someone messaged you about. Hey, I'm looking for a green hat. So you will then put green hat in your spreadsheet and you can find it easily. So for you, you are a tagger, a categorizing type of person. But the, the big thing here is what is efficient for your business, for you and, 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 and go from there. Um, now, sometimes we will have to learn how something that's a little out of our comfort zone, like a category of categorizing and organizing, that's out of our comfort zone. But if you're doing this for a business, that's kind of the, the growth piece, right? Um, I always go with, hey, go with what feels the easiest for you. Like, don't try to go create new habits all of a sudden. <laughs> don't just wake up and say, I'm going to be a spreadsheet person and you've never opened Excel or Google spreadsheet before, <laughs> because that, that in itself will be a whole learning piece. Hey, I'm not saying you can't go for it, but go for the, you know, just maybe just keep your, your spreadsheet and paper and then learn something new. So start with what you know, define efficiency for you and your business, and then go from there because we have so many categories. We have the, if you're a book reseller, you can have the Dewey decimal type of organizing. I had a collector of books that we organized and um, they wanted their entire library to be done exactly like their local library has it because that's how they find books. Um, so we did, we created the whole Dewey system for them and that was their happy place. Does that make sense for everybody? Of course not, but that's what made sense to them. Um, so efficiency, 
for you, but define it for yourself. And I think some people also shy get cringe when they hear the word efficiency, you know, like, oh, that's so square. I just kind of go, especially creatives, like, I yeah, just yeah. With what feels good. It seem very confining to say you're efficient. Yes, yes. But efficiency just, it's what you, it's good for you. How is that? How do you define it? It's not just efficiency, it just means it's going to be the best way possible as fast as you can. Or, but within your world, it doesn't have to be defined by somebody else. Um, so I hope that people to kind of take that out of it. Like it could just be as you create your efficiency. Don't let, let others create it for you. Yeah. And back to the numbering system, I'm constantly reorganizing. So, oh, this, this tub of sweaters is getting full. I need to start another one. And so, you know, I split them out by some criteria that what do I have the most of? Is it cashmere? Is it cardigans? Is it uh, men's versus women's? And so I'm constantly doing that to reorganize when something gets full. So if I have a number on it, that's not going to work for me because I'm just too visual. Um, but that's not to say it doesn't work for somebody else. Um, but yeah, or, you know, you get to a point where you have a bunch of something that's not selling anymore. You know, that market's dead. It's not selling anymore. You want to get rid of it and start new things. Um, I'm getting into selling postcards and I love it because I'm finding them at estate sales and you can get like a thousand of them. They fit in a shoebox size uh, plastic tub, you know, and that's perfect. It doesn't, it's a thousand things that hardly takes up any room now most of them aren't going to sell for more than $10, but when you got a thousand of them over time and they're so small and easy to ship, I'm looking for more stuff like that. Um, but you're, the point is that eBay sellers, your business is always changing. Um, what worked five years ago may not work now. And you've constantly got to be looking for the next thing you want to either experiment with. I mean, I spent a hundred dollars on those postcards. But to me, that's the cost of education. I will get my hundred dollars back. I don't know how long it's going to take, but um, there could be some in there that, you know, sell for big money. I don't know. Uh, but the point is that with organizing, you're constantly re reorganizing what you have. And especially if you're buying a lot of inventory, we talk about the death pile. That's just all the stuff you bought that you intend to list. And next thing you know, it's taken up a whole room. <laughs> it's, it's because the treasure hunt's the fun part. And, and I think that's also the piece of figuring out, you know, what kind of business are you and are you a collector? That's also quite a, a difference. You know, we, we do have people, um, one of our clients was an artist and she just was a collector and she was okay with that. Um, she sometimes sold things, but at the end she realized that she really just liked, enjoyed collecting. Now, if you're doing it as a business, that's where the business hat comes in. And sometimes those are hard boundaries to draw. Um, you know, the, oh, but I, but this is special to me. Well, that's okay. That's special to you, but that goes into category of now it's your personal stuff. Now it's your you're, you're a collector and, you know, you go down the path of that, figuring your, your, yourself, you know, a path of that and journey. But if you're going down the eBay business journey, then that is, what are the numbers telling you? What are the people telling you? What are you, what do you enjoy going and finding? Absolutely. But that at the end of the day ends up being about being a business and being sustainable for that. Um, but those are kind of those two, the very, it's a very slippery slope, but I think also self-reflection and honesty of, you know what, I buy this and a lot of it and it's piling up because I like it because it's really for me and it's filling a void for me or a past trauma for me, or, you know, I didn't have these when I was little, but now it's a personal journey versus a business journey. Um, and I think that's, important to note when you are trying to be, you know, an eBay reseller and, and go from there, uh, making those decisions, you know? Well, and you have to love what you're selling or you're not going to want to work on it. So one of the things I sell are called loveys, the little, mm -hmm. little blankies with a stuffed animal attached mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. And they're just, 
they're just cute and soft and they're easy to wash. And I just think they're adorable. And like, I don't want to sell rusty tools. You know, that's not pretty to me. I don't want to, if I had a box of rusty tools in my office, I would just keep pushing it to the side and never, never tackle it. Cause I don't like that. I don't like the way it feels. I don't like the way it looks. It's dirty. <laughs> so, and that's part uh, of the enthusiasm that you carry though. You like, you, you light up as you talking to, are you talking about that, which return being returns ends up being a good business, you know, but you yeah, like so it. It's, and it's, a, a good business. it's a balanced blend of selling what you can find, what's going to make money and what you like. So many newer sellers are like, what should I sell? And I always just say, start selling stuff around your house and see what you like to work with. Some people absolutely hate listing clothing. It's just um, tedious and cumbersome and you have to do measurements and they don't like it. And me, I'm like, oh, I don't like to sell all clothing. I don't want to do jeans because they're just, they're heavy and they're a pain to photograph and I don't like them. And, but you know, the, the beautiful uh, sequiny tops and the soft, luxurious cashmere sweaters and, you know, old um, vintage gloves, like the elbow length, you know, the opera gloves. And yes. the, I, just, I think those are fun. They're just um, anything that's vintage, that, like has a history or, oh my gosh, I remember wearing this back in the eighties, all that kind of stuff. So, um, and, and I get emails from sellers all the time and they're like I know you love selling clothing I just I just don't like it <laughs> I'm like you don't have to <laughs> yeah it doesn't have to be and that I that's what I love listen like when I listen to your your episodes that's that that's it you know it's this there's there's no right or wrong but you but if you're going to be doing this all the time and going to treasure it's like yes yeah. I'm like yes she's totally right because if not then they just will end up in your closet and then you'll have to hire an organizer to come in. Yeah. And like, I just can't wrap my head around electronics, like mm -hmm. why people want to work with those. And that's their thing. Maybe their high is when it sells and they get a whole bunch of money for it. But to me, it's just, it's not a very tactile experience, you know, taking a picture of a VCR or whatever. Hey, there's a lot of money in electronics. It's just, I can't get on board with that. I'm not, attracted to that <laughs> so. well that's something else that I have found um, being in this doing this for a long time there's entire communities for everything as you know you know for all the sellers of types uh and also collectors and what I have found is some people really get into the the thing but also the history of it and then the parts of it I know I mentioned earlier like wood so one thing that came for over the years uh I then found a wood maker who would want to source and buy those old TV stands, you know, but the like wood oak, like the really heavy ones that were always so hard to give away because they were so heavy. And we didn't have those big, big uh, televisions anymore for people to put their TVs in. But this woodworker uh, loved working with that type of wood for some of his projects. Anyway, so he reached out and said, hey, if you have people that are looking to let that let let those things go. No, let me know. Anyway, so he introduced me to that whole community. And I thought, oh my gosh, when I looked at these TV stands that people were trying to, you know, to get rid of, I didn't even think about the community that came behind, like around it and the parts around it. And I guess some of them had a very specific type of a uh, um, knobs for the center, for the side compartment where the audio, you know, electronics would go attach to the TV and the stereos and stuff. And they were looking for the parts for that. And I'm like, I didn't even, because most people would get rid of like the whole thing, right? They're like, well, yeah, it's the wood, but it's the community of like the enter the old, you know, 60s to 70s entertainment <laughs> system people. And that whole community, you know, were looking for things. And, and it's like, sometimes you forget about people are looking for the parts or other components of what you think is just an item, but maybe it's other pieces of it that are not just the actual thing. Um, so that's been a big, like I've I've had clients kind of go down that route. Like if you know your parents or your loved one had a very specific type of thing, yes, look into 
um, like those types of collectors and, and sellers, but also the sub categories of that, you know, whatever material the stuff right. was made out of. And this has nothing to do with anything. It just popped into my mind as you were talking about TVs. Have you seen where they're taking the old console TVs and taking the guts out of them and making them like a little pet apartment? Yeah. You know, curtains on the front. And it's, you know, it's, I just think that's adorable. And mm -hmm. what a fun way to keep the old giant bulky console TV mm -hmm. out of the landfills. We all had them back in the day. And <laughs> and they're expensive so to let, and they're expensive to let go of. Like those are well, for the most part in the U.S. You know, different world uh, parts of the world is different, and even even different counties. But you have to pay a fee for most of them. You know, to get rid of those. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we're getting towards the end. And one question I wanted to throw out there was if um, eBay sellers are looking to find a professional organizer to help them or possibly partner with them to get some of the discarded things that may look like trash to y'all, but we're like, oh no, don't throw that away. Um, how, is there an organization you go through or how do you find people to approach for that? Yes. Okay. So I belong to the NAPO, which is National Association of Professional Organizers and Productivity Specialists. I know it's a, it's a mouthful, um, but it's NAPO. There's also different subsets of that. Um, so go to that website, you know, napo.com um, for the association piece. You can also just message me at hello at the organized flamingo.com. And I can put you in touch with people if you're specific, if you're looking for very specific things. Uh, and then, and then the other is, are you willing to travel or not? So that we know, you know, which state and I can put you in touch with somebody in that state. So if you're looking for those things, please let us know. We love to partner up. Um, and so that's that one. And then if you're looking to have someone organize, you, you know, just either reach out to me or the association and we can help you with categorizing. Sometimes you love everything about eBay, but you're just looking for someone to set you up one time. Like, hey, can you just set me up? I can do the rest. I just don't have the time or I don't want to um, get me, you know, my shelves up, just kind of clean it up a little bit. Give me some categories that I can follow. Um, can you get my spreadsheet? organized and then I could do the rest. We we would be people like us, we are happy to do that. That that's what we do. Our brains are are meant for that type of thing. So that's how we can help. Well and I think um I don't think it has anything to do with intelligence, you know, if your office is a kind of a disaster, it's this is overwhelming. I don't want to do this. I don't like doing this. I need a helper. Mm -hmm. And there's there's kind of an embarrassment factor of I know I should get somebody over here to help me, but I don't want them to see this. How do yeah. you approach that? Not at all, please. That's just, I, I, I get the sentiment and, um, but we, that's what we're meant to. We've seen, we've seen things and we love it. Like, that's what we do. You know, that to us, like what you feel is a mess for us is like a, a project, the potential, like the amazement of it. And we, we love it. Like there, you know, you may be embarrassed by it, but we're here like, yes, let me help you. And don't be embarrassed. So, oh my gosh, you know, there's, there's, there's us here. We, we love it. And you keep up us in business, but also just, we love it. Like, you know, what you don't love someone else might. And so I would always, you know, encourage people to not be embarrassed about that because that's you, but I may love it. Well, and it, it didn't get that way overnight. Yeah. It takes a long time for things to get out of control and you're not going to get them back in control in an hour. It takes time. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And also you, sometimes you, when you're in it, you can't see it. You can't see from in and out. Like you don't even know what happened. Um, and you just need an outside just outsider's perspective or somebody to come in and just have you clean, you know, have st start from scratch again so that you can go from there. And then the other side of the coin is what if some of the listeners are like, you know, organizing is my thing. I love it. I can't, you know, I can't wait to get my hands on a project and get it organized. Um, and they wanted to get into this business. How would they, is there an organization where you, you know, learn and are trained or, you know, if that's something they wanted to try to do as a business, where do they start? Yeah, well, have them uh, definitely email message me because um, there are, there's different ways of 
there's in that you can intern, you can just go and try it out and see if it's something you like. Because one big thing that I'd like to just mention is when you do it for yourself and you enjoy it, but then when you do it for other people, um, that is a very, that's a, that's a whole nother realm. Like if you just like to do it for yourself or your um, neighbors or friends, that's, there, it, it's not always as fun. It's there's quite a bit of the mental piece of it that you're helping other people. It's almost like a coaching piece of it. Um, and once you get into that, it, some people realize like that's not what I meant. I just meant I just want to go in and and make it pretty or style it. Uh, so um, reach out and then we can talk about like what is it that you like? What, what would you like? Because there's different avenues. You can go the styling avenue, stager avenue. And so that's a different avenue than the coaching side of it. Uh, the mental health piece of it, that's a very different part of it. The decluttering piece of it, there's different branches to organizing. And so um, if you kind of tell me where, what you think you would like to try, um, what another thing is I would then um, try to shadow or help different types of organizers and then start to see which one it is that you like better because then that is then you can join an association that is that can help you hone in on what you ended up liking um from there so yeah great okay well that's a lot of helpful information um do you have any last words for the listeners oh yeah mark to mention there's also like the moving piece of it there's quite a oh, bit of yeah. moving. it's like the moving specialist um we don't do those but there's also uh, yeah, so the, just know that there's different branches of it, and I'd love to help if I can with where you would like to end up if that's what your realm is. Yeah. Okay, and your website again is? You can go to theorganizedflamingo.com. And what made you pick that name? long story short they used to call me chicken legs when I was younger uh -huh. and I used to tell people and I loved the color pink and yellow and in high school I said you know what I'm not a chicken I'm a flamingo so when I got the opportunity to start this side of the business at the time I had the other business um I I was mature enough to say you know what I'd like to close the loop and um, call it something that meant a lot to me and then once I learned about flamingos and how well they adapt they're such a birds that adapt really well I'm like that's what we do that's exactly what we do we adapt that's perfect yeah very creative and no competing for a website name because there's probably not another one out there <laughs> <laughs> great very well nice. Stephanie thanks so much for volunteering to come on and share your wisdom and um again the organized flamingo.com Mm -hmm. Check out her site or reach out to her um, with any of your organizing questions. Yes. Thanks for having me. Great. Have a great day. Bye. On to today's trivia question, which is more of an educational question to get you thinking. What is the impact of clutter on mental health? We already know that too much stuff can be emotionally and physically draining, but there is more to it. Here's some pretty music to help you think about it. Okay, and I'm not asking this question or asking you to think about this to judge anybody, but this is meant to help you if you are feeling overwhelmed. All of us have some degree of clutter in this physical world we live in. So first, how do you identify clutter? Ask yourself these questions. Do you own anything that you never use or no longer need, like clothes that don't fit anymore or old electronic devices? Do you have a junk drawer of things you think you'll need but you never use? Do you buy new items to replace ones you've lost in your house? Do you lack access to certain spaces in your home, such as you can't open the door to your basement or park in your garage? Are you afraid to have guests over because of the state of your home? So the impact of clutter on mental health really is far-reaching. 
it impacts your physical space in an obvious way, but some people don't realize that clutter can have negative mental effects too, such as increased stress levels. Your home is a place where you should be able to rest and relax. However, clutter can make it hard to do that. One study found that women who reported more clutter in their homes had higher levels of the stress hormone cortisol throughout the day compared to women who had less clutter. Clutter can also contribute to household chaos, which is associated with worse parenting practices, negative emotions, and stress. Clutter can actually cause problems with focus. It's distracting. Our brains can only focus on a limited amount of stimuli at a time. So if you're surrounded by clutter when you're trying to work from home, for example, the clutter can actually make it harder for you to think clearly. Procrastination. Research shows that people with cluttered homes tend to procrastinate on important tasks. You might have to dig through stacks of papers to pay the bills, or maybe you have so many piles of dirty clothes that it feels overwhelming to even start the laundry. Clutter can also lead to difficulty with relationships. It's not uncommon for spouses, partners, or even roommates to argue over whether one person's things are taking up too much space. There might be added strain in a relationship if your clutter is an annoyance to the person you're living with. Also, clutter can cause trouble with controlling impulses. One study found that a cluttered environment combined with an out-of-control mindset triggered participants to engage in unhealthy eating behaviors. In other words, the research suggests that it can be more difficult to control your impulses when your mental health and your environment are stressful or chaotic. Lower quality of life. Clutter can easily lead to a nearly constant feeling of frustration as you struggle to complete daily tasks. The time you spend looking for objects you need or attempting to organize your items could be time spent with loved ones, doing self-care, or just relaxing. And finally, decreased well-being. The clutter in your environment can even cause you to develop negative feelings about your home. In a 2006 study published in the Journal of Environmental Psychology, researchers suggest that this is because home is more than just where we live. Instead, they suggest that home is a constellation of situations, experiences, and meanings. The individual shapes these experiences, but they are also shaped by them. So just something for you to think about if you are trying to tackle the clutter in your home, which accumulates very quickly. It didn't get that way overnight, and it's going to take some time to tackle it, but you're doing a good thing for yourself if you can reduce some of your accumulation, your possessions, keep what makes you happy, and send the rest away. Okay, next week, my guest is Sally, who posts regularly on the Money Making Monday thread and is a 20-plus year veteran on eBay. She has some cool flips to share with us. And thank you, listeners, for spending the last hour with us. I appreciate all of you out there, and I hope you have a fantastic week on eBay. Talk to you next time. Bye, everybody.